Welcome to Life Happens, where Texans come to protect their legacy and prepare for the second half of life. Join your host, Attorney Kim Hegwood of Your Legacy Legal Care, and our weekly guest as we navigate the challenges that emerge as life happens. Now here's your host, Kim Hegwood. Good morning and welcome to Life Happens with me, Kim Hegwood, and our very special guest today is Mandy Solomon. Good morning. Hello, Kim. It's such a pleasure to be here. And I, well, I'm super excited. And so because when I found out your, about your information, I was like, oh, this is going to be great because we're going to talk today about how can the digital world help someone with dementia. Mm. And so um, and you are, I guess I, I hate to say the, you know, use the words. It doesn't sound phenomenal. OK, because you've done something that for me is just inspirational and beneficial. And so so I'm going to quit gushing. And um, and we're going to talk about the software that you created to help people with dementia and their caregivers. And then when we get to that good part, we're going to talk about why, you know, because there's always a story, you know. Yes, yes. Let's talk about the software. Tell us about it. Okay. So what we've created is uh, a, uh, it's essentially an app, which you download from the app store. And um, it's available on Google Play and through the um, Apple App Store. So you can play it on any tablet, but it must be a tablet because the essence to this app is that uh, our users, who are people living with dementia, tap on objects inside a world that we've built. We use a game engine for this, and they tap on meaningful objects inside the world that animate the minute you tap on them. The moment you tap on them, they come to life. So you tap on a flower, and it starts to grow. You tap on the cat, and it meows. You tap on the food bowl, and the cat walks over to the food bowl and eats the food. And so it's, it's, a, it's a world that we've built using a video game engine that is full of personalized objects, and meaningful objects and activities that you might do in your day-to-day world around those objects. And the whole idea behind it is that we give people the opportunity to interact on a digital platform with virtual activities um, that respond to their own lived experience. And I'll hold it there because I'm sure there'll be more questions. So, uh, why this software? Why in particular was this something that inspired you to do? Yes. Um, I took myself back to university uh, and to do a PhD around how to solve the problem of what I thought was a technological laziness for people who need support to amplify their sense of self, which gets diminished by dementia. So how come we can have all kinds of personalized software to amplify ourselves when we are cognitively well, such as, you know, YouTube, Pinterest, Instagram, Facebook, all the social medias. It's all about here's me and here's the wider me, here's the broader me, the bigger me. Think about what happens when we have a cognitive uh, impairment. Our world starts to shrink. We can't get around as much. We don't communicate as well. We... uh, uh, get left out of social activities and so if anyone on the planet needs help to amplify that sense of self it's people living with cognitive decline and it struck me that the technology world was extremely lazy in not addressing that need when it's so good at customizing and amplifying so i set around about doing some research to think well what would firstly why a digital life and i think we can talk about that secondly what would in, what would uh someone living with dementia what would cause them to um engage so what is the engagement piece and how what's the kind of software that allows them in to do that engagement and i came across this concept of the virtual world um And by that, if you think of The Sims or you think of um, World of Warcraft or any of the video games that our friends, relatives or even ourselves might play, there's a world that's created. There's interaction. There's roles that get played out. And I thought that if you could configure a world that suited people with um, diminished cognition, why wouldn't the same thing work for them? So I madly investigated other 
other platforms, other worlds. I went into role playing games online and I discovered that no one with cognitive decline was using them. So people with physical inabilities, uh, disabilities would use them, um, create incredible heroic avatars for themselves to, you know, do wonderful um, carry, go on missions and carry armor and save damsels and all that kind of thing. Now that could be someone that's very physically handicapped. Um, but can express themselves in this environment in a more, you know, I feel more myself in this world than I do in the actual world. Someone actually said that to me. But then people with cognitive difficulties were not in these worlds. So this is where I began to think, well, how can we configure a world that such people can use? And so I developed the prototype and the rest, as they say, yeah. here we are today. <laughs> So, you know, when you think about it, you know, um, you know, a lot of people forget how to do a lot of things when it, when they yeah. have dementia. Yeah. So why do you think leading a digital life is important uh, for people who have dementia? Mm. Well, firstly, digital gives us access. So I want to see my photographs. Um, I've got masses of photographs but they're all online, so I need to be able to access them. I mean, moving forward, if we're talking about uh, people who are 100 years plus, you know, they probably haven't had much of a digital life. But as our generations age, people are just, it's totally instinctive to want to intera interact with digital artifacts. Um, all the things we've collected in our lives, if you think about them, all the people we're connected to, uh, you know, so much of our lives is a digital life. and. Um, but not only that, if you take away the fact that increasingly generations instinctively know how to use digital tools, if you take that away and say, well, okay, imagine I've never used, never picked up anything that's electronic and digital before. What can a digital world offer me? Well, it can offer a sense of, and I can explain this if it seems a bit, you know, cuckoo, but a sense of agency. <laughs> so if I find it hard to change a light bulb in my house but changing my environment is something that is really something I've always you know I've always loved doing and we all do we all love to manipulate our environment um, I can no longer do that however if I'm presented with a digital world which is what we've built where I can change light bulbs change fabrics um, change patterns on rugs move around the house and do little bits and pieces and do things um, and go outside and pick, pick vegetables. This is bringing back the memory of the actual activity. And I'm able to have a sense of agency. So I tap on the carrots and they go into my basket. Well, firstly, I've chosen the carrots out of everything else that I can see. I'm going to pick carrots. And tapping is a pre-reflective response that we have had since year dot pointing, tapping, touching. This is something that people find they can do. And even if they can't, we have ways around that hand under hand to help people tap on the screen. But I've chosen to go to the carrots. So that's a choice. Secondly, I'm choosing to pick the carrots. That's another choice. And thirdly, I'm seeing, I'm seeing the outcome of that action, which is the carrots are now in the basket. So we are now finding that, uh, you know, as a person living with dementia, I'm making choices, I'm selecting, and I'm seeing the outcome of my selections. Now, if we think about what that means for someone who is constantly facing restriction, um, in, a, in accessibility, and um, quite frankly, often failure, I didn't, I didn't manage to do that, I couldn't do that, then being able to do them virtually is, um, is, is a bonus, this is a huge bonus. Now, if I have someone sitting next to me while I'm doing that and they see what I'm doing, that immediately sets up a connection. I'm talking about a care partner um, who's sitting, or you know, care staff who's sitting with me. And, oh, Mandy, what is it about carrots you like? Oh, I love the color. Do you? Orange, I never knew that. Do you know you've got an orange cardigan in your wardrobe and I don't think I've ever seen you wear it. Would you like to wear it? Yes, I'd love to wear it. Suddenly, this carrot can become a whole 
jumping off point for something else that brings meaning to a person's life. So this is the way we see our software working. And it's it's very, very rich and um, rewarding and people enjoy it. It's it's fun. So you use the video game technology to set it up. So yes. you know, and you do it on a you said a tablet. So like mm -hmm. I have an iPad. Exactly. And so I hit the iPad, I hit the button on the iPad to start the software. Does someone yeah. need to do that? Or do you find that people with dementia see the button and they know to push it? I mean, how easy is it is, you yeah. know, for for them to, you know, because of how it's set up, exactly. can they can they do the, you know, hit the button or know that or does someone else have to do that? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's fundamental. Um, well, it does depend on the level of uh, impairment. Now, I should just preface this by saying we're focusing on people who are in the, say, the middle stage and beyond of dementia on their dementia journey. We're not talking about newly diagnosed people who, you know, may still be in employment. And in fact, I am a huge uh, advocate for people staying in the workforce as long as possible and um, having technology that supports them to do that. And that you could say is part of having a digital life. You know, how do I use text to speech, uh, speech to text so I don't have to use that silly keyboard, you know, all the things that we're seeing. And of course, artificial intelligence, that's another piece of the equation. So all these things are helping people who are newly diagnosed and have say, or have mild cognitive impairment to do what they want to do longer. And that's brilliant. But when you get to a point where language is an issue, um, confusion, um, unsettledness, agitation, it, perhaps you've got the type of dementia that causes um, uh, visual disturbances. You know, we're talking about a different level and this is where, where, where we operate. So um, we don't expect people to go and initiate a session as we call it on their own because, you know, that's not really where the person is at. So a care partner would sit down, open up the air, up, open up the tablet and simply tap on the icon as you would with any app and up comes the world. Now there's a, there's a, a welcome screen. So if you're a care partner, if you're a care staff person working with five or six clients, you would select your person. And the way you can select your person is because there's a dashboard that accompanies this just a web on the web where you set up your players, add content that's meaningful to them, like photos, videos. That's another story. Let me get back to your actual question. So when you've selected on your person, up comes, uh, the world opens. It's literally like watching a piece of theater and the curtains open and they see their photo. And that's the first point of contact. So all they need to do is then with your suggestion, or maybe they can read because we have verbal, we have text as well, tap on your photo. So you tap and then suddenly you're in the world and it opens in a sitting room. You meet people in the world who talk to you. Well, hi, how are you today? I'll come and have a look at my world. And so on it goes. Now, we have historically had a care partner sitting next to that person and they work through the program together. But we're also building an AI version, which really takes the role of the care partner. So greets the person by name, knows the person, is able to direct the person to different parts of the world that they know they like. For example, they might want to go to the sitting room and listen to music. Well, our persona inside the world will take them there. However, in the current version, the um, care partner is the one that, that works with the person and, and would suggest things, just as our AI person in the world is going to learn how to do, it. like best practice care partner. That's what the AI persona will be. Um, now, some people can continue to play on their own once they're in, and other people really enjoy working with a care, a, what we call a support person or a supporter, and they do it together. And it's very rich for the supporter too, by the way, because you learn a lot about your person. If you know that when they tap on things, it's the, ro it's the path to a meaningful conversation or exchange of some sort. Do you find that, you know, that 
that seniors are usually, <laughs> usually adopt to these new technologies? Well, again, a lovely question. Seniors adopt to them. The hardest thing is for care staff in a residential living to adopt to them. And I'll tease that out for you because it's very interesting. Um, what we are looking at is helping to build person-centeredness into the care experience. And every residential care facility says, you know, we're person-centered, we value the person. But in reality, staff are short, people are overworked, um, and care staff who are in the personal care area, uh, direct care staff, have a roster. They have to make sure this is done, 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 and then there's breakfast, and then this is done, this is etc. So if you say to such a person, okay, stop, don't rush, take time with your person, have a session like this and have some fun together, but also bring that person out as you do it. Because expressing sense of self, which is what we're focused on, is to my mind, the single most important thing we can do for our loved ones and our clients. If imagine that we cannot say who we are, what we've done in our lives, what we think about the world, what we're experiencing now, Imagine we can't do that. It, it, it is like being in a, you know, a sheath a, a, that you can't get out of. And so anything, any technology that can help me to get out of myself and share and express, and as I say, amplify, is a critical piece to well-being when you're living with dementia. So people with dementia, it's been designed for them. It's been co-designed with them. They find it a great experience, but the staff, it's a change of workflow. It's a change of, in, in uh, practice. And when you think about who is working in personal care, and I've experienced this, we are more and more seeing people with low proficiency English who come from other countries. So they don't necessarily share a cultural uh, landscape of that person that they're working with. I mean, I had someone say, oh, she wanted to play Elvis Presley. Uh, she wanted to, she wanted to watch a video of a of a guy in leather in a in, in in a box and there were a whole lot of them in the box and I said, oh that sounds like Elvis Presley in uh, Jailhouse Rock. She said, oh yeah, I think she said something about Elvis, but I didn't. So this this care worker didn't know who Elvis Presley was, and why should she? She came from the heart of Africa, and she she just hadn't grown up with this sort of culture. So things that seem really obvious to the person and to the organisation it may not be obvious to the staff member. Plus, it's challenging to say, okay, you've always bathed uh, Mrs. Simpson and you've always helped her get dressed, etc. But now you're going to interact with her on a, uh, we can use different language, on a, you know, psychosocial level. And it's like, what? Well, that's not my job or I, I don't have the confidence to do that or I don't know how to do that. So these are the practical challenges So one of the things that I didn't ask you right off the bat is, what is the name of the software? What's the program? Okay. Yes, thank you. So the program is called DEVA, D-E-V-A, World. Um, and DEVA, if I can explain, um, it's a bit of a conceit. Um, when I did my research, I had a pro the, the prototype called AVID, A-V-E-D assisted virtual engagement tool for dementia something like that I can't even remember quite offhand what, what it was uh, and so when it came to naming what I was doing in a commercial sense it's just an inversion of those words avid became diva uh, but at the same time diva is a Sanskrit um, word which means God a God one of the many gods comes down and helps you in the real world so I thought that's really cool because we're using the internet, everything's based in the cloud. And, um, and then since then, this whole concept of avatars has become quite a mainstream concept. And um, so again, Diva fits into the concept of, 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 of a virtual persona. And so it's Diva world. Now, we are moving, as we move towards our AI product, which will be um, released next, early next year, um, we are uh, renaming it. 
Mentia Companion. Mentia is the name of the company, Mentia Companion. And when you enter, when you get involved with our companions, you'll find them in Diva World. So it's a little bit of a, a brand shift, but I don't want to confuse users with that. At the moment, it's Diva World. The other thing, Kim, I would say is that because we came across that low proficiency English and this uh, with our care staff, and uh, this is you know all throughout the OECD, it's not just America's issue, um, and increasingly that's where our care staff will come from. We wanted to create, we wanted to take our learnings of where the obstacles and um, roadblocks were for staff and see how we could use the video game technology for them. So we're now creating a video game for staff, which teaches them about how to help people express their sense of self and to understand and decode what they might be trying to express, which comes out as, you know, behavioral responses that are challenging, such as, you know, go away, aggression, agitation, unsettledness, all the things that our, our people living with their loved ones would know a lot about. So before I let you go, I have a quick question on when you you said something about that you could upload a photo of the person. Mm -hmm. And um, so are you able to upload photos of family members yes, being yes, in the yes. digital world? Yes. So when you are on the dashboard, which you the, the, to download the app is free. Anyone can download the app. But in order to make it work, you have to go to our website and subscribe and at that point you have access to a dashboard now the dashboard you can upload photographs of anyone and that appears in the memory book next to the big red chair in the sitting room and we urge people to upload not just pictures of family but anything that might be of interest to the person that they might be mad about war medals or orchids you know you can take video clips clips off the internet you oh sorry um, graphic stills off the internet or off your own library or wherever you get this or you go to the garden and picture that person's favorite rose that just happens to be in bloom you know all of these images can be put onto the dashboard and then they'll see them when they tap on the memory book inside this the world and oh and there's the photos we also allow people we can also make books or family members can make specific books so say someone really likes certain psalms in the um bible or they might like uh, poetry of some sort or a favorite recipe um, you can write those up in with text and you know we we give tool tips on how to make it short and sweet you don't need to write you know screens of information and then there are books on the bookshelf so you person taps on the book and oh there's their favorite sports players or their so we cut we provide curated content but you can also customize the other thing you can customize is um paintings so you can choose to put a painting on the wall from images that you've collected it could be a granddaughter's drawing it could be uh, the Mona Lisa which reminds me of the trip we went to when we were in Florence together etc oh actually it's in the Louvre I think the Mona Lisa <laughs> um, so you get the picture mm -hmm. in fact people say you know Having a photograph of uh, Sacramento in the 1960s, a chemist shop in Sacramento in the 1960s, was more powerful than having a photo of my husband because it, it brings out new stories, makes helps someone make new connections. So you can be very broad in what you choose to put on those, in those photographs. That's phenomenal. So, Mandy, if somebody wants to get in touch with you, learn more about what you're doing, you know, software, kind of how do they do that? Yeah, so I please reach out to me personally. I would be loving, love to communicate directly with any of your your listeners and viewers. Um, and then we, I'm so I'm Mandy at mentia.me. That's M-A-N-D-Y at mentia, dementia without the D-E, mentia.me. And our website is https www.mentia.me. Perfect. And so thanks so much. This was such a good, such a good time spending time with you today. And so uh, I look forward to seeing the software and uh, yes. so I'm download it when we get off and check it out. Kim, and, I'm so, so grateful for the time and to meet you. It's been, it's been lovely. And so you as well. And so, all right, you have a great day.
Bye, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Life Happens with Kim Hegwood. Be sure to tune in every Thursday at 10 a.m. wherever you listen to your podcasts as we navigate through the challenges that emerge as life happens. The content of this podcast does not establish an attorney-client relationship or constitute attorney-client privilege, legal, medical, financial, or any other professional advice.